Good morning and welcome once again to the Des Moines Church of Christ. Thanks for tuning in with us here today. It's been so encouraging to see our online community growing more and more. I just got a message from a Christian on the Gold Coast of Australia thanking me for the sermon. She was sharing that she and her husband watch them each week and that's pretty cool to know that we have viewers down under like that. Last week we began a new series of sermons on one of the most inspiring and stirring books in the entire Bible. It's Paul's letter to the Philippians. And in that lesson, I mentioned that while I really enjoy topical and practical sermons like we've been doing for the past several months, I also really enjoy substantial and exegetical sermons where we dig deeper into the scriptures and prepare to feast on the meat of God's word in the manner in which he inspired it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And actually, those types of sermons can be just as practical and just as inspirational, if not even more. So that's what we're doing with this letter to the Philippians. In lesson one, we covered the pertinent historical background information of Philippians to help us understand the context in which it was written, and then that in turn helps us to understand its full message. 
Paul had started the church there in Philippi a, a while back and was thrown into prison there. Then he was released and he went on to the next city. Now about 10 to 12 years had gone by. It's 10 to 12 years later. And once again, he's in prison for the gospel, but this time he's in Rome. And it's really interesting. Barry and I uh, have been to that exact prison in Rome where they believe Paul was held captive at that point. And man, it is not a pleasant place. It's just a classic Roman, dark, dreary dungeon. It's a place you would not want to be. And while he's in prison there in Rome, he wrote this letter to the Philippians. He'd heard from some people that there was some serious disunity in the church. And he also feared that, that the Philippians might be unsettled by his second imprisonment. He'd been in prison there before. Now he's in prison again. He thought, oh, they may be concerned about me. That may shake up their faith because facing trials like that can really shake our faiths. So he wrote this letter to encourage them to focus on Jesus. And he was totally confident that if they really focused on Jesus like that, that would help solve their unity problems and help solve their problems of facing trials like that. In the letter, Paul mentioned Jesus more than 40 times in just these four short chapters, 104 verses, but 40 references to Jesus. The theme verse, like we shared about last week, is Philippians 1.21. That captures the whole essence of the letter more than any other verse in it. And I challenge all of you to memorize it. And so I wonder right now if you could stand up and quote that verse from memory. Philippians 1.21. Can you do it? Last week in our young professional house church, we call it the Yo Pro House Church, we had everybody go around and say that verse. And it was really pretty cool. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What a great verse. Well, today we're going to dive into chapter 1. Now, whenever Paul would write a letter to a church like this, I can imagine the whole church would gather together and listen to that letter being read aloud to them. That's what we're going to do with each chapter as we study this book. So pretend you're one of the Philippian Christians, and this letter has just been delivered, and you're hearing this chapter for the first time. And if you have a Bible there, follow along with your Bibles, but I'm going to go ahead and read Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, and that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, and again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Man, what a cool chapter that is. I can imagine the Philippians, when they heard that, were just like tearing up. Many of them knew Paul. They remembered him, though he'd been there a decade before when he started the church. Others had heard about him, and he was kind of a legend. So they hear this chapter one. And of course, there's three more chapters that, that we're going to follow after that. Well, what a great start to the book chapter one really is. We're going to break down chapter one and apply it to our lives. First, Paul starts the letter, as he does most of his letters, with a brief greeting. In chapter one, verse one through two, he, just, he and Timothy are together, and they just greet the church and the leaders there. And then he goes on to share some personal reflections about the Philippians and about his imprisonment as well. And that takes up the entire first chapter, basically. So with after the, that personal greeting in the beginning, the whole rest of the chapter is him just sharing his heart. And so we get a really great glimpse into Paul's heart. And you know, this is one of the richest treasures that we find in many of his letters, that every once in a while, we get a behind the scenes look into his heart. He shares vulnerably and we see things that we didn't know about how he thinks and how he feels. Those are some of my favorite parts of the whole New Testament because Paul was such an amazing force in Christianity and really an amazing force in history for that matter. He, he was a true spiritual hero. And so it's pretty cool to peer into his heart and to see what really makes him tick. Here in chapter one, we can see two primary dimensions of his heart, and we're gonna focus on those two today. First, we see his heart for the people of Christ. His heart for the people of Christ in verse three through 11. Let me put that up there, verse three through 11. Okay, it's probably too small for you to read, but you can read along in your own Bible. But this entire section is just Paul expressing how much he loved and cared for his brothers and sisters in Philippi. And he had a lot to say. It wasn't just, love you, you know, I, I really think about you every now and then. I mean, he went on and on sharing about how much he really cared for them. And I wanna highlight here the passion words that he uses when he talks to them that really show his heart, okay? He doesn't just use like kind of generic words, but he uses words that are really indicative of his passion for those people. He says in the beginning, I thank my God. He just starts right off, I'm so thankful for you. Every time I remember you, he remembered him. 10 or 12 years have gone by and he remembers them. And then he talks about his prayers three times in all my prayers. I always pray. And then he says exactly what he prays. That's pretty cool. And then he says, I always pray with joy. He had joy as he prayed, as he remembered the Philippians. And then he talks about his partnership in the gospel with them. They, they were buddies. They were partners in the gospel, and he reminds them of that. And then he says, from the first day until now. He says they were partners then, and they're still partners today. 
nothing's changed. They're still very much in his heart, even though a decade has gone by. And then he goes on and says, listen, I have confidence. I have confidence in the way that God is working in you. Confidence, you're going to make it to heaven. And then he says, it's right for me to feel this way about you. He had feelings for them. And he says, it's right that I feel so deeply about you. And then he says, I have you in my heart. That's pretty cool. It's kind of like a love letter. I have you in my heart. He says, you share in God's grace with me. We share this together. And then he adds, I long for you. Again, that's really passionate. I long for you. And he says, God can testify how much I long for you. And then he describes how he longs for him with all the affection of Christ Jesus. So you think, oh, and then he says, in addition to that, he doesn't just say this is for like one or two people in the church or the leaders of the church. He says all of you, four different times in here. He says this, this is all of you. This is all of you. It's not just a little click. It's not just the people that I connect with. It's all of you. I feel this way about all of you. And so you put all those words of passion, I highlight them all, and you look at it, you go, man, he used a lot of passionate words in this short section of scripture just to describe how much he really cared for them. And then if I highlight just the phrases he said to them, they're so heartsy. He said, I thank God for you. I remember you. I pray with joy for you. I feel this way about you. I have you in my heart. I long for you. I have the affection of Christ for you. And so expressive. And remember, this is what he wrote from prison. Again, a full decade after being with them. And remember, he'd only been with them for several days. Remember the Bible said that? He stayed in Philippi for several days. So he was only with them for several days. A decade plus has gone by. Now he's in prison and he's still writing these kind of passionate, affectionate words for all of the disciples there. That's pretty cool. You know, he had all kinds of good reasons for why he wouldn't even be thinking about them, let alone write a significant letter to them, and to do that from prison nonetheless. But he just really loved his brothers and sisters in Christ, and it showed through his words. After all, he was a true disciple of Jesus. Jesus had commanded his disciples to love one another just as he had loved them. And that's exactly what we find Paul doing here. So when we see these words that are being used right there, all those words that I've highlighted for them, we can see how passionately he cared about all of them. Well, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Or some other translations in the NIV, it used to say, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever's really in your heart, Jesus says, that's what comes out of your mouth. So by what comes out of your mouth, we can see what's really in your heart. As we see these words that came out of Paul, they came out of his heart, we can conclude, man, he passionately loved his brothers and sisters in Christ in Philippi. So with that in mind, let me ask you, when you talk about your brothers and sisters in Christ, in your church, in your ministry, what do those words reveal about your heart for them? What is your heart full of? that comes out in those words. Do your words ever show that you have a critical heart? Do you say negative things about other people? Things like, man, he's so superficial. She's so weird. They're really immature. He's prejudiced. She's intimidating. They're too conservative. Well, they're too liberal. They're not committed enough. You know, I don't care what he thinks about me. You, you get the point. It's so easy to let those phrases just kind of roll off your tongue. They come from a critical heart, critical words. 
indicative of a critical heart. And then oftentimes we think it's okay to say those things by patting them with something like, oh, bless their heart. You know, you know that's a Southern thing. Whenever you say something that's really negative about someone, you just say, bless their heart. And that just kind of takes away the negativity and criticalness of it, or so they think. Or you add in, but I really love them. And, and that really has nothing to do with it. You still have those critical thoughts, but you say, bless their heart. Or you say, but I really love them. But still those critical words are coming out of a heart that's critical towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. It reveals your heart. I know I've fallen into that trap. It's easy to fall into that trap and have a critical heart. Or maybe do the words you use show that you have a detached heart from your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you say things like, sorry I missed the meeting again. Sorry I didn't respond to your text. Oh, I forgot we we're supposed to get together. I'm just too busy to meet. I don't have time to get with you. I can't reply to every text I get. I don't have time to pray for them. I don't need to confess my sins to other people. I don't need anyone trying to teach me or disciple me. Maybe I'll be there and maybe I won't. Do the words you share like that reveal that you have a heart that's somewhat detached from your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or do the words you use about your brothers and sisters in Christ show you have a passionate heart for them, just like Paul had? Do they really show, wow, that person just loves their brothers and sisters in Christ? Your heart is revealed by the words you use to describe other people. Let's imitate Paul as he imitated Jesus and grow in our passion, our devotion, and our affection for each other. No matter what others are like, no matter how much you have on your own plate, you can still love like this. That's our whole theme for the year here in Des Moines, to, to love, to have love that's overflowing, that the Lord will increase our love to where it overflows to the people around us. And we talked a lot at the start of the year about how we can grow in our love. Let's be reminded of that from the example of Paul, how we can grow in our love and have a true heart for the people of Christ, just like Paul. The second dimension we see in Paul's heart was that he had a heart for the gospel of Christ. A heart for the gospel of Christ. And we see that in the second half of this chapter, verse 12 through 30. And let's break it down and show in each of these sections what he says and what his heart is about the gospel of Christ. First in uh, verse 12 through 14. Verse 12 through 14, I, I'm not going to read it through here. To, we just read it. But basically he says he was, he was actually excited about his imprisonment because his chains were being used to advance the gospel. And they were being used in a couple ways. He said, first, everyone here in prison and all the palace guard has heard the gospel because of me. They've heard about my chains and I've been able to preach to them here in prison. So I'm fired up to be in chains because I can preach the word to them. And then the second way he's fired up about it is because other brothers and sisters that have heard about him in chains have just gotten emboldened. They're like, man, you know, he's so committed. He's preaching the word so courageously. He's in prison. I need to go out there and preach courageously. So he said, man, I'm excited excited about having these chains and being in prison because the gospel is advancing. And then in verse 15 through 18, he says that some were preaching the gospel just to stir up opposition and to cause more persecution against him. Now, think about that. That's pretty rough. People were literally going out, okay, not real Christians, obviously. They were going out and preaching about Jesus just to cause a nuisance, just to get the authorities really mad so more persecution could be brought upon Paul. They weren't doing it to really preach about Jesus. They're doing it just to get him in trouble. And so he heard about that. And he said, some people are out there doing it with false motives, just trying to, to get me in more trouble. But then he says, but I don't care. As long as the gospel is preached, it's all good. Even though it was messing him up, he just was fired up that the gospel was preached. And then verse 19 through 26, he talks about the suffering that he's endured because of the gospel. That all this trial and all this suffering is going to help him to stay saved. It's going to work out. 
for his own deliverance. And so he was welcoming the trials. He was welcoming the suffering because that just drove him to Christ. See, he felt like those trials kept him focused on Jesus and detached from the world instead of focused on the world and detached from Jesus. When we get really comfortable in the world, we can get attached to the world and we can get distant from Jesus. But when trials come, tough times come, that's when we start focusing on Jesus and detaching from the world again. And that's why Paul was welcoming the sufferings and the trials that he was facing. And he said that they too were going to have to go through similar trials and similar sufferings. But it's all good because the result is a closer walk with Jesus and a surety of salvation. And this is where he shares in this context our theme verse, to live as Christ and to die is gain. And what a cool verse. See, he doesn't say to live is fun or to live is pleasure or to live is an adventure or to live is happiness. He didn't say that. If that were what his life was all about, then suffering would be fatal. How could he have those things? if he were suffering, if he were in prison. But that wasn't what he was living for. His life was for Christ. It was to live for Christ. He felt like being here on earth, it, it's only going to help more people to be saved. I'm just living for Christ. And so the longer I'm here on earth, the more people I can help to become Christians. And if I die, it just means that I'm going to go and be with Christ. So either way, down here on earth, I'm preaching Christ and bringing more people to Christ. Up there, if I die and go to heaven, I'm going to be with Christ, and that even be better. But to live is Christ, to die is Christ, to die is gain. It just doesn't matter because I'm only living for Christ in the first place. I love that thought, to die is gain. Now, we don't typically think that way about death. And with COVID, we fear getting it because we might die. You, know, you cross the street, you look both ways, you don't want to die. And obviously, we don't want to die, okay? We want to protect our lives. There's no doubt about that. But Paul's attitude was, listen, if I were to die, that's better by far because I get to be with Christ. To die is gain. It reminds me of this story I heard. There was this brother who was in Mexico City as a businessman. And he was in this public restroom somewhere with his briefcase. And he was washing his hands. And then some guy with a gun just came in, pointed the gun at him and said, give me your briefcase. And the guy put his hands up. The Christian put his hands up and he goes, listen, don't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> and the guy just looked at him like, what? And then he like reached down, grabbed the suitcase and he ran or the briefcase and he ran out. And then just a few seconds later, the bathroom door opened again and he threw the briefcase back in and ran off. He's like, uh-oh, I don't want to mess with some holy man there or something like that. But that was such a cool thought for that brother to say that just right off the bat in the heat of the moment. Don't threaten me with heaven. If you shoot me, I'm just going to die and go to heaven. Pretty cool attitude. That's kind of what Paul was saying here. Then in verse 27 through 30, he wraps up this chapter by saying, whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. He says, live according to the gospel. You know what the most challenging word in that sentence is? I mean, it's a challenging sentence. To conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whoa. But the most challenging word in all of it is whatever. Whatever happens. No matter what. You live your life, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. No matter what comes your way, live like Jesus. See, he could call them to that because that's exactly what he was doing by writing this letter while he's in prison. He was doing it joyfully, faithfully, selflessly, and lovingly just like Jesus. The whatever for him was chains in prison. And he was still conducting himself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And he was calling them to do the exact same thing. See, it's not so hard to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel on Sunday 
when you're surrounded by a bunch of other people who are trying to do the same. But when whatever hits, your true spiritual self is revealed. For us, that whatever has gone to a whole new level these last several months, hasn't it? We've been faced with all kinds of whatever, from racial inequalities to raucous rallies to riotous mobs, from pandemic uncertainties to political tensions to powerful storms. Man, just in the last couple weeks, we've had a hurricane on the East Coast, a derecho here in the Midwest, massive wildfires on the West Coast, and then now there's two hurricanes in the Gulf and the South. I mean, just crazy times all around us. Well, Paul says, whatever happens, those are some pretty big whatevers, whatever happens, live according to the gospel. When whatever happens to you, when whatever happens to you, what do you tend to live according to? What's your reflexive way of acting when whatever comes your way? See, sometimes we we just naturally live according to our feelings. We feel something, and so we conduct ourselves according to that feeling. We lash out, we shut down, we run away. We just live according to our feelings. Or sometimes we live according to our fears. We just have these fears and so we we try to dodge the situation, avoid that conflict, get out of that situation. We just try to live according to our fears. Or sometimes we just live according to our friends. What's everybody else think? What's everybody else doing? And then we just go with the flow, go with the friends. But see, God is calling us to live according to a higher standard, the gospel, the truth about Jesus. Whatever happens, wherever you are, whatever you're facing, whomever you're with, you're called to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. See, he's calling them to consider the gospel and advancing the gospel their top priority and passion in life. The gospel and advancing the gospel, he wants them to make it their top priority and passion in life, just like it was with him. And that's exactly what it means, if you think about it, to be a Christian in the first place. It means Christ is number one. See, that's the heart of a true follower of Jesus. That's the heart of a true follower of Jesus, to make the gospel and advancing the gospel the top priority and passion in your life. And he's showing them that if they have that attitude, then their problems and their persecutions won't really matter anyway. Because God can use those problems and persecutions to advance the gospel. And that's what real Christians hope for and want more than anything in the first place. So even the bad things that happen only advance what you really wanted to have happen with your life. I've seen this over and over in my life. You know, I think about the health challenges and some of the other challenges, there was all kinds of challenges that Barry and I were facing in Denver. And those things ultimately prompted us to move to Iowa. Those were difficult times, times that I wonder like, why is this happening what's going on? But then I see God use those adversities to get us here to Iowa to preach the gospel here. And the pe- so many people have become Christians here that may not have otherwise. So it's all good. That's all that ultimately matters, that the gospel is advanced. That's all we want with our life when all is said and done. And like I shared a few weeks ago, we've seen that same thing happen throughout the entire church here in Des Moines during this COVID crisis. I'm so proud of the church that, that during, these, during these challenging whatever times, We're reaching more people with the gospel than ever before. We're studying the Bible with more people to teach them about Jesus than ever before. We're baptizing more people than ever before. Whatever happens, if you focus on Jesus and his gospel and live according to that, God's kingdom will advance. So in chapter one, we look into Paul's heart and we see what he was really living for each and every day of his life. The people of Christ and the gospel of Christ. Let me ask you, be honest. What are you really 
living for? What are you really living for? Right now, what's the top passion and top priority of your heart, of your time, of your schedule, of your resources? Is it your career, your hobby, your family, a girlfriend or boyfriend, the weekend, or nothing? You can't even think of what you're living for. Or is it really Christ, his people, and his gospel? If you're really striving to live for Christ and his people and his gospel, like Paul, you're living on a higher plane. You're rising above the fray of the world with all of its problems, all of its persecutions, all of its pitfalls, all of its pleasure. You're rising above those traps and the fray, and you're really bringing glory to God and advancing His kingdom. That's the best life. That's the ultimate life. That's what it means by saying to live is Christ. Let's all strive to imitate Paul's heart for the people of Christ and his heart for the gospel of Christ. And so make that the theme of our life as well. To live is Christ. Amen. Now I have some discussion questions. I do this each week to uh, give you some things to think about and digest just to help you apply the message to your life. Or you can talk about it with your friends or family or like we do here in Des Moines with our house churches. Let me put these questions up here. Number one, consider the two dimensions of Paul's heart we saw in chapter one. His heart for the people of Christ and his heart for the gospel of Christ. Which one struck you the most and why? Number two, what can you do to imitate Paul and strengthen the area you're weakest in? And then number three, how can you help others to grow in the area they need the most help in? Okay, those are really good questions. I hope they help you. Now we're gonna go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds for our communion, for the Lord's Supper. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for being a God that cares so deeply about us. We love because you first loved us. And thank you for giving us your word to help us, to teach us. Thank you for the book of Philippians. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for his heart and for the influence you had on him so he in turn can influence us. We're built up and we're moved by his, his letter 2,000 years later. That's just amazing. Thank you for his example of that heart for the people of Christ and, and heart for the gospel of Christ. As we think about Jesus now, as we consider him and his death, burial, and resurrection, I pray that you'll give us a greater passion and a greater heart for him. Help us to love his people more. Help us to love the message more, the gospel more, the good news more. Help us to really commit to that, that mantra, to live is Christ. You are a life. We want everything we do to bring you glory and pleasure. And we commit to that now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next week as we cover chapter 2 in Philippians.